In downtown Toronto, amid the tall steel and glass buildings, stood the Toronto Dominion Centre. Inside, many lawyers worked, and among them was Gary Hoy, who was well known not just for his courtroom skills. A man of 38, Gary was known for his boundless energy, indomitable spirit, and an unyielding belief in the impossible. His colleagues often joked about his dual role as a lawyer and an unofficial ambassador for the architectural marvel that was the Toronto Dominion Center. His fascination with the building he worked in, particularly its unbreakable windows, was well known throughout the firm. Gary's days would usually sail smoothly across a sea of legal documents, client meetings, and courtroom debates. But amidst the usual humdrum, there was one tale that he loved to recount and demonstrate, a tale that showcased the indomitable strength of the Toronto Dominion Center's windows. On that fateful day, July 9, 1993, the sky wore a blanket of thin clouds, the sun peeking through just enough to cast a gentle glow upon the city. The atmosphere within the law firm was light, with the usual chatter filling the rooms. But as the clock ticked, the casual day was about to take a dramatic turn that none could have anticipated. Word had spread that Gary was about to perform his legendary demonstration once again. For the uninitiated, this was a spectacle not to be missed, and for the seasoned, it was a show of familiar thrill. It had become a sort of lore within the firm, Gary's unwavering faith in the unbreakable glass. He had done it before, hurling himself against the glass to show it would not shatter. Each time the glass had held firm, each time the crowd was left in awe, each time Gary's legend grew. With a room full of curious eyes, Gary was ready. He stood before the towering glass pane on the 24th floor, the world sprawling endlessly below. The excited murmurs from the crowd hushed as Gary took a few steps back, the quiet replaced by the rhythm of his heartbeat echoing through the room. Was it the thrill of the unknown, or his unyielding trust in the constructed reality, that drove him? Whatever it was, Gary was a picture of confidence as he sprinted towards the glass, his eyes fixed on the horizon. The moment arrived, a gasp escaped the room as Gary collided with the glass. True to the legend, the glass didn't shatter, but this time, something was amiss. The glass pane, with a terrifying lurch, popped out of its frame. Time slowed as Gary, along with the unbroken glass, plunged into the abyss below. The room froze in a terrifying silence, only to be shattered by the horrified screams that followed. The unbreakable glass had kept its promise, but at a cost nobody could have ever imagined. The city that had stood tall and proud was suddenly plunged into a chilling silence, its facade of invincibility shattered by the tragic fall of Gary Hoy. As the reality of what transpired sent shockwaves through the firm and beyond, it was a harsh reminder of the fine line between confidence and overconfidence, between reality and illusion. The hubris of invincibility had met with an unforgiving reality, and as the news raced through the city, wrapping its cold fingers around the hearts of Toronto's denizens, everyone was left to grapple with the haunting image of that fatal plunge. But as the city mourned, questions began to rise, swirling around like the ominous clouds that now hung over the Toronto Dominion Centre. How could such a tragedy occur in a modern marvel of architecture? What went wrong on that ill-fated day? And as the law firm plunged into a storm of scrutiny, the fallout from that day began to unfold, exposing the fragile line between human faith and the forces of nature. The harrowing event sparked a comprehensive examination of architectural standards, shedding light on the quality of materials and the adequacy of safety measures in modern constructions. This discourse was further amplified by structural engineer Bob Greer's pointed statement, I don't know of any building code in the world that would allow a 160-pound man to run up against a glass and withstand it. Alongside this, the ripple effects of Hoy's demise significantly impacted his law firm, Holden Day Wilson. In the subsequent three years following the incident, there was a notable exodus of talent from the firm, with over 30 lawyers choosing to depart, unable to come to terms with the devastating loss of a cherished colleague. The firm, which once thrived with 90 lawyers at its pinnacle, 
found itself grappling with the sudden void left by the tragic loss of a beloved partner under such shocking and public circumstances. The emotional and professional aftershocks reverberated through the halls of Holden Day Wilson, leaving a lasting imprint on its legacy. This monumental shift was not just a numerical decline, but a profound alteration in the fabric of the firm's community, embodying the human cost of the tragedy that unfolded on that fateful day. Amidst the storm of repercussions, the law enforcement authorities categorized Hoy's death as death by misadventure. Amidst the collective mourning, Peter Lowers, the managing partner at Holden Day Wilson, reminisced about Gary as a bright light with the firm, a generous person who cared about others. This reflection not only encapsulated the emotional toll on individuals, but also highlighted the personal connections and the sense of camaraderie that defined the essence of Gary Hoy's relationship with his colleagues. The legend of Gary Hoy, the unbreakable spirit who tested the unbreakable glass, would live on. His story wasn't just a fleeting whisper, but a deep echo that resonated through the chambers of law, the halls of architecture, and the heart of humanity. His fall was a grim tale that would be recounted with a mix of awe and dread, a story that would, in its own haunting way, serve as a grim reminder of the delicate dance between human endeavor and the unforgiving reality of life. Karen Vetterhan's story is not just a tale of scientific endeavor, but a stark reminder of the fine line between curiosity and calamity. Born on October 16, 1948, in Plattsburgh, New York, Karen was a beacon of ambition and intelligence from a young age. Raised in a modest household, she exhibited an unquenchable thirst for knowledge that set her apart from her peers. The small-town milieu she grew up in could have easily stifled her academic aspirations, but Karen was destined for a larger stage. Her academic prowess was a ticket to a world brimming with endless possibilities. She ventured beyond the familiar horizons of Plattsburgh and embarked on a scholarly journey that saw her graduating with a degree in chemistry from St. Lawrence University in 1970. The academic accolades she garnered along the way were a testament to her dedication and knack for scientific inquiry. Yet, it was her insatiable curiosity that propelled her further into the realm of academia. The journey led her to Columbia University, where she earned her doctorate in inorganic chemistry in 1975. Her dissertation, a rigorous exploration into the world of toxic metals, was a harbinger of the illustrious career that awaited her. It wasn't long before her academic exploits caught the eye of the esteemed faculty at Dartmouth College. In 1976, Karen crossed the threshold of Dartmouth College, marking the beginning of a remarkable new chapter. She was not just a brilliant addition to the academic cohort. She shattered the glass ceiling by becoming the institution's first female chemistry professor. The corridors that once resonated with the achievements of her male predecessors now echoed with the fresh perspective and indomitable spirit Karen brought to the table. Her enthusiasm for science was infectious, making her a revered figure among her students and colleagues alike. On August 14, 1996, the routine calm of Karen's lab at Dartmouth College was pierced by an incident that would later reverberate through the halls of scientific institutions worldwide. While working under a fume hood, a few drops of dimethyl mercury spilled onto her latex glove. Unfazed, Karen followed the standard safety protocol, washing her hands thoroughly. However, unbeknownst to her, the colorless liquid had already begun its deadly journey through her skin, entering her bloodstream within seconds. As days turned into nights and summer gave way to autumn, a sinister malady began casting its shadows over Karen's health. Initially, it was nausea that gnawed at her, which she perhaps dismissed as a minor ailment. But as weeks rolled on, her body began to signal something far more sinister. Her speech slurred, vision blurred, and balance faltered. The vibrant corridors of Dartmouth that once resonated with her enthusiastic discussions about chemistry now bore witness to her struggle as she sought to unravel the mystery ailment that was tightening its grip over her. As November dawned, the veneer of normalcy was shattered. Karen found herself in the throes of a medical mystery, her symptoms escalating with each passing day. Despite the encroaching malaise, her determination to find answers remained unyielding. 
The medical fraternity was initially baffled, but the diagnosis, when it arrived, was a thunderbolt, mercury poisoning. The dimethyl mercury, a substance she had handled with academic reverence, had betrayed her, seeping through the supposed barrier of her latex glove with a lethal ease. Dimethyl mercury is not just any chemical. It's a neurotoxin, one of the most potent known to humankind. Its interaction with the human body is nothing short of a death warrant, as it mercilessly attacks the nervous system. And Karen, despite her vast knowledge, found herself ensnared in its deadly clutches, with every tick of the clock pulling her deeper into an abyss. The transition from being a beacon of knowledge to becoming a victim of a silent, deadly predator was a harrowing reality that Karen and her loved ones found themselves grappling with. The ordeal was not just a battle against a lethal chemical, but a race against time, as Karen sought to hold on to the threads of hope. The ordeal of collation therapy began, a desperate attempt to purge the venom coursing through her veins. Each day was a battle, a flicker of hope amidst an encroaching darkness. Karen, who had dedicated her life to unraveling the mysteries of toxic metals, now found herself in a grim struggle against one. As the months rolled on, Karen's condition worsened. The woman once revered for her intellectual prowess now found herself in a battle that seemed increasingly insurmountable. The medical community rallied, but the neurotoxin had already insidiously woven itself through her nervous system. By February 1997, the relentless onslaught of dimethylmercury pushed Karen into a coma. The silent corridors of Dartmouth seemed to mourn the loss of a vibrant spirit as her lab lay in a somber stillness. The dread of what seemed inevitable hung heavily over the scientific community. The news of Karen's fatal encounter with dimethylmercury was not just a blow to her loved ones and colleagues, but sent shockwaves through the scientific realm. The harrowing reality that a highly experienced chemist could fall prey to such a catastrophe, despite adhering to the perceived safety protocols, was a jarring wake-up call. On June 8, 1997, the battle ended, leaving the world bereft of a brilliant scientist. Karen's demise was not just a personal loss, but a stark reminder of the lurking dangers in scientific explorations. The lady who once delved into the mysteries of toxic metals with a fierce curiosity had become a somber emblem of the precarious dance between human inquiry and the forces of nature. The aftermath of Karen's ordeal was a catalyst for introspection and change within the scientific community. The tragedy laid bare the inadequacy of the existing safety protocols. The latex gloves, once considered a reliable barrier, had failed miserably against the onslaught of dimethylmercury. It was a harsh revelation that spurred a wave of reforms in laboratory safety standards across the globe. In 1974, in the quiet suburban stretches of Croydon, England, lived 48-year-old Basil Brown, a man whose ordinary demeanor veiled his unconventional dietary habits. A staunch health food advocate, Basil dedicated his life to what he perceived as a pinnacle of physical well-being. Every day, Basil found solace in his unique regimen. A gallon of carrot juice and a considerable dose of vitamin A supplements were his daily companions. His faith in this regimen was unyielding. To Basil, each gulp of carrot juice was a step toward vitality, each pill a promise of longevity. His convictions stemmed from a simple belief Nature's bounty, harnessed the right way, was the elixir of life. But what happens when belief blinds reason? When does an earnest endeavor morph into a perilous obsession? The world around Basil buzzed with the emerging health food trend. People were turning towards organic produce, shunning the artificial for the natural. But, as the community dabbled in this newfound awareness, Basil was on a league of his own. His daily routine wasn't a mere flirtation with the health food trend. It was a full-fledged commitment. Basil's mornings were as predictable as they were peculiar. As dawn painted the sky with hints of orange, he'd embark on his daily ritual. The sound of his old juicer grinding against the fresh, crisp carrots was the unofficial alarm for the neighborhood. The resultant orange concoction, rich and thick, was more than a beverage to Basil. It was a ticket to invincibility. His faith in the healing prowess of carrot juice was unyielding, 
a gallon a day, he believed, kept ailments at bay. Alongside, the vitamin A supplements lay on his countertop, a necessary add-on in his quest for health. The pills were small, innocuous, and to Basil, they were shields against the onslaught of diseases. His regimen was far removed from the casual dietary experiments of his peers. Basil was in a realm of his own, a disciple of nature's pharmacy. However, unbeknownst to him, the veil of invincibility was starting to fray. As days morphed into nights and back into days, a sinister plot was unfolding within the confines of his liver. Each gulp of carrot juice, each pill, was a step not towards vitality, but towards a perilous precipice. The fatal ten-day stretch began uneventfully, but as the days rolled on, his consumption soared to an alarming level. The gallons of carrot juice he consumed weren't just a part of his routine anymore. They were an obsession. The excessive vitamin A was not just a shield anymore. It was a ticking time bomb. On the tenth day, the bomb detonated. The overabundance of vitamin A overwhelmed his liver, initiating a catastrophic sequence of events. His skin started betraying the turmoil within, turning a bright, eerie yellow, the hue of caution. His body was now a spectacle of the lethal dance between man and nature. The staggering 70 million units of vitamin A coursing through his veins were a grim testimony to how a quest for health could morph into a harbinger of death. As the liver buckled under the onslaught, the grim reaper was closing in. On a cold morning, as the neighborhood woke up to the familiar hum of Basil's juicer, the catastrophic narrative reached its climax. But today, the machine was grinding on its own. Its master lay motionless on the floor, his skin a ghastly shade of yellow, a stark, painful contrast to the vibrant orange liquid that dripped from the counter onto the floor, pooling around the lifeless body that once housed a man known for his peculiar dietary pursuits. The news of Basil Brown's demise sent ripples through the quiet community of Croydon. It was a somber, morbid reminder of the fine line between dedication and obsession. The coroner's inquest was succinct, Carrot juice addiction was cited as the cause of death. It wasn't just an end of a man's life. It was a stark, brutal exposition of the perils veiled in extreme health fads. As the media latched onto the story, the narrative of the health enthusiast who turned yellow from his dietary excesses gripped the nation. The images of his lifeless body, the skin a ghastly yellow, juxtaposed against the vibrant orange of carrot juice, were emblematic. The tale was a peculiar blend of curiosity, disbelief, and a somber warning. The discourse around health foods and supplements took a somber turn. Basil Brown's tale served as a chilling anecdote in the narrative cautioning against unregulated consumption of health supplements. The stark imagery of the outcome of his dietary excesses resonated far and wide, urging individuals to tread the path of moderation. His tale morphed into a cautionary narrative shared in hushed tones among health enthusiasts. The questions it posed were profound and unsettling. How does one differentiate between a healthy habit and an obsessive ritual? Where does one draw the line? 